All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, John. Um, welcome to our next episode of OpenStack Online Meetup with uh, John Dickinson from Swift. John's going to talk about Swift 2.0, which has been released well, a couple of weeks ago. Is that right? About a month ago, yeah. Oh, a month ago, okay. And uh, one of the key features here is uh, storage policies. So this will be today's topic. And uh, with that said, let me hand over to John. But maybe before you start your presentation, maybe you tell people who you are and what you do. You're wearing a couple of uh, hats, as far as I know. So let's start with that. <laughs> right. Great. Thank you very much for having me today, uh, having me back. Uh, it was great to talk about Swift a few, uh, a few months ago, I think I was here. Uh, my name is John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift. That's the object storage implementation inside of the overall OpenStack project. Uh, I was on the team that was uh, that originally developed Swift inside of Rackspace before it was open sourced, and so I have been a part of OpenStack since the very very beginning, and it's been a really exciting uh, four years or more now, um, and so I'm very happy to talk. Uh, uh, to you today about what's going on uh, recently with Swift. Uh, currently, I work at a company called SwiftStack, uh, based in San Francisco. We provide managed uh, uh, management software to help you run your own uh, OpenStack Swift uh, storage uh, clusters. Uh, so it's been a really big, exciting, um, exciting past year for us as we've been working on this uh, set of features, and so that's what I want to tell you about today. So let me share my screen and move into a little bit of some presentation to help us, help guide us along. Great. So at a few points during the time, I will uh, stop and see if there are any questions, and Raphael's going to help me with that. Uh, but to start with, uh, Swift 2.0 is what we released in the beginning of July. Uh, this is an official. Uh, production ready release that you can use. It's part of what uh, is in the overall OpenStack Juno cycle. And so I'm really excited about it. This is, in my opinion, the biggest thing to happen to Swift since it was open sourced four years ago. And uh, it's, so let me tell you all about it and why. Uh, it's, first off, though, I think the, the biggest point is the fact that we've upped the major version number. Uh, we've gone from our 1.x series and now have gone into uh, 2.0. So the big deal with 2.0 is we have storage policies. So the first big question is what are storage policies and why are they such a big deal? I spent a little bit of time uh, talking about this in Atlanta and I'm sure we'll spend some more time talking about it at the summit in Paris this fall. Uh, but to give a first overview, let me uh, back up and uh, talk a little bit about that uh, very quickly, some important concepts of Swift itself and then we'll talk about how storage policies fits into that and, and what was changed. So to start with, the first thing I want everyone to understand is uh, the pieces that make up Swift. So an API request is uh, very simple inside of Swift. You have your standard domain that you're using. Uh, you have your API version. Uh, this has always been v1. Uh, with this release, we have not uh, made any sort of backwards incompatible changes to the API. So it's still a very stable API that's been been around for over five years, in fact. Uh, and this. Uh, so we're still at v1 of the API, but the three important pieces of Swift are the account, the container, and the object. And this is how they're referenced. So uh, you'll reference those on the uh, URI of, a, of an HTTP request. Uh, your account is ba basically uh, a storage location that you are given access to. Um, a container is, you can think of them almost like folders. You can't really nest them like folders, but uh, they're, they're very analogous to S3's buckets. And uh, inside of the account and container, you basically have a list of, of the other ones. So the account has a, has a list of all containers, and a container has a list of all the objects inside of it. And each of them have some associated metadata. And then all of your data is stored in the objects. And the objects would be things like your images, your, your videos, your pictures, your, your documents, your backups, all of that sort of thing. The data is stored inside the object itself. Um, and so that's what the API looks like. You just use standard uh, uh, HTTP verbs, uh, so you can get and put and post and delete to these different URIs, and that's, that's what you do. So the overall pieces of what makes up an actual Swift system 
uh, how do these how do these work together? Swift basically has two major pieces. You've got a proxy server and you've got storage nodes. And the storage nodes can be an account container or object uh, server, and uh, those are respectively responsible for their uh, pieces that you saw in the API. Uh, but to start with, a proxy server is responsible for uh, coordinating all the communication with those backend storage servers, and it handles all of the interaction with the end user. Uh, and so in this case, the proxy server implements most of the API and then make sure that the data is placed well, that you can read the data, uh, that the data is available, and uh, coordinates all of the uh, communication there. So the data path flows from the, from the end user through the proxy server to one of the uh, storage nodes and then, and then back out through the cluster. And so this is uh, a really powerful design uh, we've found as uh, Swift has been deployed uh, at all kinds of scales all over the world. Uh, the really great thing is that this this is a very modular design that lets you need lets you add more where you need more. So, for example, if you need more end user client throughput, then you can add more proxy servers. And if you need more back end storage, uh, you can add more object servers. And you don't have to add just kind of uniform pieces all at once. But in this case, you can uh, very specifically customize your deployment infrastructure to your use cases. And that, that concept right there is actually what I think is, is fundamentally important about the storage policies. Uh, being able to explicitly uh, match your infrastructure to your use case. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in, in a while. Uh, but for now, the important pieces here are that uh, you've got uh, just a couple of major uh, pieces uh, that make up the Swift uh, storage engine. Now, the important point about Swift, what, what does Swift do is, uh, is always a good question. And the important fundamental piece of Swift is that Swift is abstracting away storage volumes. Normally, those are thought of as hard drives, but you can imagine you know, any sort of uh, technology here, new or old. Uh, the point is that you don't want to explicitly tie your data to the media upon which it's stored. You don't want to have to think, well, here's my hard drive, and that's where the movie is stored, the video. And if I lose the hard drive, I lose the video. The information is decoupled from the storage system, and what this allows is that Swift, as the storage engine here, allows you to have heterogeneous deployments of hardware, uh, different kinds of storage volumes. It allows you to uh, deal with hardware failures seamlessly. It allows you to, uh, to adopt new technologies, again, seamlessly, and uh, allows you to uh, be assured that your data is both durably stored and highly available in your system without having to worry about, especially the end user having to worry about what's happening with uh, the particulars of the hardware inside the cluster, uh, dealing with things like uh, with those hard problems of storage, especially when you get up to big scale, filling things up, about dealing with locking and concurrency, dealing about uh, permissions and, uh, and availability, durability, all of that sort of thing. That is, that is what Swift does. Swift separates the data from the storage media and abstracts away the storage volumes so that applications don't have to worry about the hard problems of storage, but can simply treat it as a utility that they can uh, consume on demand. So the important point about uh, storage policies is that it gives, uh, it gives deployers access to, uh, like I said, customizing their deployment to their use case. And there's a few different ways that this can be done. And I'll go into some more detail in a bit, but an overview here is that in a, with the storage policy, you can choose what hardware your data is stored on, how your data is stored across that particular piece of hardware, and then even potentially if you have different sort of hardware that requires different protocols, for example, not a POSIX uh, storage device, uh, but maybe something else, then uh, you could even separate off that and be able to use that um, as a as part of the storage policy. And so the, with these three things, uh, you can see that some of them are chosen by the client and some of them are chosen by the deployer. So for example, let me give you a couple of use cases and I'll, uh, I'll expand on these in a, in a bit as well. The, but for the overview, you could imagine that uh, you could set up a 
a geographically distributed cluster and then choose that uh, one set of hardware in one region is going to be where you're going to store some sort of data. For example, maybe something that's only lo uh, accessed in a particular region. Um, and then even uh, you have the power to say that once you've chosen that subset of hardware on which you're going to store your data, um, then you may want to choose that it is going to be stored with triple replication, maybe maybe uh, reduced redundancy with just two replicas, maybe something higher because of other requirements. Or potentially, uh, in the future, the ability to store things in a non-replicated sense using erasure codes or something like that. Um, and uh, the protocol piece is very important uh, when looking at different sorts of storage volumes. For example, Seagate's kinetic platform, um, looking at uh, some of the, the work that um, other people in the community have been working on, on uh, mapping Swift to deal with different sort of storage volumes. So this is a basic, very high level overview of what Swift is and the kind of things that Swift will allow you to do. So to, summar to summarize this piece, uh, Swift allows you to take a take commodity off-the-shelf hardware and uh, store your data there just kind of in an on-demand place so that you don't have to think about concurrency, you don't have to think about scalability, you don't have to think about um, availability and durability, but Swift to the storage engine will ensure that your data is highly durable, highly uh, available, and it's optimized for uh, massive concurrency across the entire data set. Now in the past, Swift has basically treated all data as the same. So if you store, uh, if you have a backup, it's going to be stored in the same way that your image thumbnails may be stored in the same Swift cluster. The thing, the key point about storage policies is it allows you to uh, to create a, a rule set essentially for where uh, the data is being stored, what subset of hardware in your Swift cluster is the data being stored on, and then how do you actually store it on that piece of data, uh, I and mean, it's stored on that piece of uh, hardware. For example, what's your replication policy, are you even using replication, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to pause now as just far as an overview. Um, are there any questions so far? Um, there are actually no questions so far. <clears throat> I see that uh, almost 20 people are with us live while Fantastic. you're presenting, John. Um, so in case any of you guys have questions, uh, feel free to ask those on IRC. We are on uh, pound openstack slash community. Dash so community. post your questions, dash community, sorry. So uh, post your questions there, I'll grab them, and uh, John will pause after each section. I think you have four, section, uh, four sections. Uh, you're, right. you're, Okay, all right, so let's uh, move on to the next section. And uh, again, feel free to ask questions. I'll collect those, and uh, John will answer those after uh, each section. Okay, great, thanks. So given an overview of what Swift does and a very high-level overview of how uh, storage policies fit in, uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is how do you actually use storage policies, both from an application perspective but also from a deployer's perspective. There's two very, very important uh, but distinct uh, users of a Swift cluster and storage policies. After we talk about how are we using storage policies, I'll talk a little bit about the actual uh, technology behind it and what was having to change and, and how that worked. And then uh, I'll finish up with a section on what does this enable for the future and, and how do we go from there. So let's talk about first, how do you use storage policies? And the most important thing I want to talk about first is from an application user perspective. I was, uh, I mentioned earlier that Swift uh, has always had a V1 API and we haven't yet updated that at all. Um, and that is still remaining the same for storage policies. We've added just a little bit to the API uh, and you'll see that in just a moment. Uh, but all existing clients will be, will be able to make at least uh, a limited use of storage policies, even clients that were written years ago. Um, but all new clients will be able to take advantage of the, the additions to the V1 API in Swift and will be able to uh, uh, really take great advantage of it. So two things uh, to look at first from an application uh, user perspective. First, this is not specific to storage policies, but uh, we have had uh, for a while now the ability to uh, do a request to a slash info 
on a switch cluster, and that gives you a, a description of a lot of things about the cluster. What what are the limits on it? What are the uh, uh, features that are enabled and things like that? So. First off, as a client, uh, you can query and see what storage policies are enabled. And in this case, I've just kind of given a little snippet of a, a few pieces. Uh, underneath uh, Swift, we've got you know, the version, obviously, that uh, has been bumped to 2.0. Uh, but also, there's a new uh, set of information called policies. And in this one, I've got three policies set up in my cluster. I've got a legacy policy, I've got my tuna fish policy, and I've got my cupcake policy. And my cupcake policy is default. Now, in reality, this will probably be a little bit more descriptive and uh, probably map a lot more towards uh, actual um, billing or descriptions of what's actually going on. So you may have, say, this is my uh, standard durability, uh, this is my global availability, this is my reduced redundancy or, or an erasure-coded policy at some point. Um, now, I do want to point out, uh, well, I'll get to the, the concept of legacy in a, in a little bit, but the point here is that uh, the application client can now uh, take these three uh, policy names, legacy, tuna fish, and cupcake, and uh, start using them. And if one is not used, then we can see from this that the default is the cupcake policy, and all, all, all uh, data will be stored if it's not explicitly mentioned otherwise as, uh, as as the rule set up for the cupcake policy. Now, once you have made a, a query to the slash info endpoint and you found what are the policies I have available, then how do you actually use them? So this is the only addition into the V1 API for Swift that we have made for uh, the uh, storage policies feature in Swift. So when a container is created on container creation time, when you do a put request to, an, to a container to create it for the first time, at that point you can pass in a new storage, uh, a new header, it's called X storage policy, and give it the name that you found out of that slash info. So in this case, we're putting the container name container, and we're giving it the storage policy tuna fish. And that's it. So if you did not explicitly set the storage policy container, you can see that this would go to the default cupcake policy. But in this case, we're creating a new container called tuna fish. Now, every single object that will be created inside of the container name here called container will be stored according to the tuna fish policy. And um, that's it. So the important points are that the storage policy is set on a container basis. It is set when the container is created and is not able to be changed uh, after the container is created. And everything inside of the container will be able, will, will take on, uh, it will be used, the, will use the storage policy for that container. So uh, you can, there, there's a few examples you can think of of how this would work. So first off, uh, as generally has been done in most Swift, almost every Swift cluster that I know of, uh, you'll have a, a container that has the standard 3x policy. This would probably be your legacy policy. And in fact, it's one thing we've uh, been very, uh, very careful to ensure is that there is a seamless migration process to say, I have an existing Swift cluster and I need to upgrade to Swift 2.0 or some later version, and I can do that without any disruptive changes to the end user, and all my existing data, no matter how much it is, is not going to have to be automatically re uh, remapped throughout the cluster. You can keep that legacy policy, basically, all, um, you could even conceptually think of it that every single Swift cluster today, no matter what version of Swift they're running, has a storage policy enabled. That's their, that's their, their existing storage policy that they're uh, storing everything as right now. Uh, this feature set allows you to add new storage policies to that. So that's essentially how we treat things. Uh, so you'll have your, con uh, your container with a normal three uh, 3x replication, but in this case, there we go, uh, we can create a new container that has a two replica policy. And there's something very important here that I wanted to point out is that uh, in, the, in this little uh, sketch up, you've got six servers, each with three hard drives, and you can see that there's an important point is on the fifth one over from the left, um, the same hard drive is actually being shared by both storage policies. 
and this is uh, this is important. So you can actually set up uh, multiple storage policies that are sharing the same hardware. You don't have to have disparate sets of hardware, which means that you can continue to uh, get a lot of efficiencies of scale and make uh, make very good uh, use of your your hardware uh, for whatever storage policies uh, you're setting up. So in this case, you may have your uh, standard. Uh, uh, 3x replication policy that could just be called legacy or standard or default or, or whatever. It's it's very high durability but also very high availability. And you then may have a different uh, policy for different uh, types of storage that uh, is just a reduced redundancy. So why would you want reduced redundancy? That would be more likely to uh, you'd be more likely to use lose your data there in some uh, uh, combination of circumstances. Well, reduced redu reduce redundancy is really important and really nice, especially at scale, when you have data that it's nice to keep around, but it could be recreated if it came to it. So, for example, uh, imagine you have your uh, high-resolution images uh, that you're using on a, on a website, but you really need to serve up and uh, manage a bunch of different resolutions, lower resolutions, thumbnails, things like that. Um, you can recreate that from the master, but you don't want to have to recreate it every single time somebody accesses it. So in this case, you can store your thumbnails in, for example, a reduced redundancy policy, uh, which would allow you to still have your high availability of your data, um, but it's a little bit cheaper to store than a 3x replication. It's just a double re uh, uh, replication, which means it's still protected against a single hard, hard drive failure, um, but if it is lost, you can recreate it. Another example may be transcoding movies uh, for different bit rates and things like that. You don't want to obviously transcode your uh, uh, your movie in real time every single time it's requested, but it sure would be nice if you could save some space on that piece of data that could be recreated. Now, your gold master uh, image there, you really need to make sure it's highly durable. So you would probably want to use something that's uh, a three times a three x policy. So there's another uh, thing you may want to try. Um, what happens if you have a uh, geographically uh, dispersed cluster? You have something that's on the East Coast and you have something that's on the West Coast. Uh, you can still treat that and you've been able to do that. Uh, Swift has supported uh, global clusters for um, a, a little over a year now and this is, uh, this is something that's great. So you can say I've got one logical Swift cluster that spans a continent or even span or uh, goes across an ocean. Um, it's really great, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all data needs to be uh, stored that way. So, for example, what we can do is we can say in this in this example we have an East Coast and a West Coast location. Um, some data is very very nice that you can store. You want to store in both. You maybe maybe you need to ensure that your backups are stored in both locations. That way, if there's a failure of an entire data center, then or some uh, natural disaster or something like that, then you can uh, you can know that you still have your uh, disaster recovery site still available. Um, but it also may be possible that you want to enable your uh, some sort of locality of access, so that if you want uh, users on the west coast to go to the west coast location. Um, that's again something that is supported with the global clusters, but Maybe you maybe the data that's stored on the West Coast isn't data that's necessarily going to be accessed by people on the East Coast. I think a, an example of this, something a use case that I've seen uh, several times, is uh, the concept of a central office and branch offices. So you may have uh, data generated in branch offices uh, for an organization uh, that's only really going to be uh, used and consumed by the uh, by the people in that branch office. So there's not really a reason to uh, give, if, it's, if for example that's in the West Coast, you don't really need to give high speed access to people in the East Coast for that because they're not really going to be accessing that that frequently. That doesn't mean they couldn't access it. They still absolutely can. It just means that when they do that it's going to uh, traverse uh, traverse the WAN to the other DC, which is if it's a low low frequency thing, that's completely okay. And so, what you can do is you can set up a uh, a couple of different storage policies that may say, "Here's my East Coast container, and here's my West Coast container." And uh, it's even possible to say, "I could have a third one that would be would span both." Um, and in that way, uh, you can ensure that you have uh, uh, ex the data stored exactly according to the use case that you have for it. 
And then I think the uh, another uh, good use case uh, that people have come up with is thinking about dip not uh, geographic separation, but actually tiers of storage. So most of the time, you're going to want to deploy Swift on spinning hard drives, just simply because the cost per gigabyte uh, makes a lot of sense uh, for that. But it does make. Uh, sometimes you really do want to have something that's uh, more performant for, uh, for example, hot data or something like that. And in this case, um, what you can do is um, uh, you can actually set up. This is going to be my hardware that is stored for my. Uh, my high performance tier, or and this is going to be my my spinning drives that are used for my my lower performing uh, uh, tier of storage. And in this sense, um, you can uh, again match the hardware and the deployment of your Swift cluster to your use case. So uh, in this example here, you can see that we've got uh, a container with a, uh, with a spinning drive policy and a, uh, con a container with a flash storage policy. And those those flash storage devices could be actually installed on the same hard uh, on the same servers um, with just unique drives um, as the spinning drives, but it's simply uh, saying that this is where this data is going to be stored and this is where that's going to be that's data going to be stored. And that way, when the client is looking at here's the data I need to store, the client can automatically make the choice, saying I know this is going to be say backups. Let's put this on the spinning drives. Um, oh, well, this is going to be my uh, frequently accessed data more hot content. Let's, let's store this in my, uh, my high speed uh, policy and that's going to go towards, uh, it's going to be, it's going to land on the, on the flash devices. So that's kind of an overview of some of the use cases uh, that uh, can be done, especially from the end user perspective. Uh, uh, I've seen lots of these use cases be presented and then I know that the community is going to uh, the, especially the deployer community is going to be able to uh, find new ways to match the storage policies to their to their use cases. Are there any questions about uh, the use cases here? Um, no questions, actually. Um, just a brief reminder to all of you guys who are watching this uh, Hangout Live. Um, feel free to ask your questions on IRC. We are on um, hash um, OpenStack pound community. So ask your questions there, and uh, we will collect them, and um, uh, John will answer them after each, each section. So since there are no questions now, um, let's move on, John. Okay, great. So let's talk about some of the technology behind it. Let's get down to the, uh, the nuts and bolts and looking a little bit more about what a deployer looks at and then what are the pieces that actually uh, we changed within Swift 2.0 to do uh, storage policies. So first off, uh, what does the sysadmin do? What what kind of impact is this going to have on uh, an admin who is managing a Swift cluster? One way to completely sum up the uh, the the concept of storage policies from the perspective of the sysadmin is that storage policies enable you to have multiple rings inside of a Swift cluster. So. Uh, one thing I didn't really cover earlier in my Swift overview is uh, the way that Swift does its data placement. Uh, we use something uh, that we internally call a ring uh, because it's uh, based on the concept of uh, a consistent hashing ring. I won't go into the details of actually how that works uh, on this podcast, uh, but the or online meetup, I'm not sure exactly what to phrase what we're doing today. Um, but the point is that uh, consistent hashing allows us to efficiently map uh, our storage devices uh, to, or I, I'm sorry, uh, map the objects onto the hardware in, in such a way that we can ensure that um, it is evenly dispersed, but also is uh, each replica of the data is stored in isolated failure domains, so that if you do lose a hard drive or a server or a rack or even a whole data center, uh, you can still uh, know that there is another replica of your data someplace else if you have those additional failure domains. So that's that's basically what uh, the, the concept of the ring inside of Swift does. And all Swift clusters have had a ring for their object storage. And what this allows you to do now is to have multiple rings on your object storage. So using the example from earlier, if you have three storage policies, your legacy tuna fish and cupcake storage policies, in this way you're eight, you, uh, what happens is that you now have a separate ring for your legacy policy, 
for your tuna fish policy and your cupcake policy, um, or more realistically named, say your uh, your gold, silver, and bronze policies, or your your uh, your uh, default policy, your uh, reduced redundancy policy, and your high speed policy, whatever the case may be. So. From the sysadmin perspective, uh, what this means is that there are, uh, instead of doing managing one ring and when doing capacity adjustment and adding new uh, uh, servers and drives and uh, replacing failed ones, uh, this now happens for each individual storage policy. And this is really what gives you the power to isolate particular sets of, or isolate or share, uh, particular sets of hardware from, from each other. So for example, if you got your, if, let's say, in this case, your legacy was East Coast and your tuna fish was West Coast. In this case, those the the drives that are uh, referred to on uh, those particular rings, uh, there's no commonality between the two because you've got your East Coast and your West West Coast. And for example, if Cupcake were the global policy, then both the drives that are referred to in the legacy policy and the t the drives referred to in the tuna fish policy, the East Coast and the West Coast policies, would all be referenced inside of the Cupcake policy, the, the global uh, uh, cluster. So what this means is that a sysadmin is managing a little uh, more rings now, one ring per storage policy, but also means that the um, uh, well, I guess that's that's about it. It's uh, you've got more rings to manage now, um, and that's the biggest change. There's a few more demons uh, that are running in the background. We've uh, uh, we've got the concept of uh, of some other things in the, in the background there. We've got a, a reconciler process uh, that will help you recover from a, a split brain scenario um, that that may that could potentially happen. Uh, but that's that's about it as far as what the sysadmin does, and uh, that's so it's not a, a whole lot more, but it does mean that uh, the management of your rings becomes uh, an important, uh, even more important piece of how you're uh, managing and growing your cluster on a day-to-day -day -day basis. So looking at um, the actual things that are make up Swift, this is uh, a, a an image that I borrowed. Uh, shall we say, from uh, a friend of mine who did, um, who works at Intel, and, and uh, he and I gave a, a joint presentation on this uh, in the, at the Atlanta summit. So all of these boxes are pieces of Swift and little individual demons and servers that run on a Swift uh, inside of a Swift cluster. And the yellow ones are ones that's changed with storage policies. So you can see that it was quite a bit. Uh, I would say that storage policies would be uh, similar to, well, to, to bring out an old trope, it's it's not only changing the tires in the middle of the race, it's changing the whole transmission. We basically went from a two-wheel drive to a four-wheel drive in the middle of a race. And we did it all so that you can do, do it with no downtime. So I'm really proud of the effort that the community uh, uh, put together, or came together to, de uh, to deliver here. Uh, it was a really great effort. Um, so there was obviously uh, changes um, in the uh, in some of the servers, the the object server primarily, uh, the replication process, the ability to do updating. Um, we we can track things on an individual storage policy basis now. For example, uh, when you query a, an account and you're able to get, oh, this is this is how many bytes I'm using in my entire account. You, you still get that, so it's, there's still a backwards compatibility there, but now you have some new information about, oh, well, I have, I have this many bytes stored in this policy and that many bytes stored in, in the other policy. Um, so we had to deal with things like container sync. We had to deal with uh, auditing processes in the object to make sure that uh, the, the right thing was done in the right place at the right time. And then, uh, obviously, in the proxy server, which, like I mentioned before, is doing a lot of the uh, implementation of the API, this is, uh, there's a lot of work uh, to ensure that the right policy is selected uh, at the right time and stored in the right place. Basically, choosing the right rings and making sure that uh, that is carried through in the entire uh, duration of the request. So, a little bit of the, so, basically, you can see here that a whole lot of Swift was changed, and this is, in a large part, why we uh, bumped the version number from the one series, the major version number, to, from one to two. Um, 
although there is a, a, a absolutely the ability to upgrade uh, without any downtime for your users, uh, one of the main reasons we chose to bump to a 2.0 release is because in our semantically versioning uh, versions uh, number scheme, we wanted to communicate to deployers that uh, if you are upgrading from a 1.x series, for example, the, the last release was 1.13.1, if you delete, uh, upgraded from the 1.13.1, uh, which, which was the Icehouse release of OpenStack, to 2.0, you can you can safely go backwards only until you uh, only before you create a second storage policy. So once you start using storage policies, you're not able to downgrade uh, to a 1.0 uh, a 1.x series because those multiple those other storage policies will just become unavailable to you because it doesn't know how to how to refer to those different rings and those different on disk storage locations and things like that. Um, so there is a great migration path, and you can even upgrade and not start using uh, storage policies, test it out, and if something happens, you can downgrade. Uh, but the point is we wanted to explicitly communicate that there is a risk associated with uh, uh, your inability to uh, down, downgrade, uh, so we, we bumped that major version number to uh, 2.0. And um, I guess a further point there, it looks it, uh, remaining in the OpenStack six-month Juno release cycle. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, one or two more releases, small releases, probably a, a 2.01 uh, or maybe even a 2.1 um, that will be included in the OpenStack Juno integrated release cycle. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about here uh, just, just briefly is uh, to explicitly call out uh, the community on their great work here. This was uh, a massive effort from a lot of people over the course of about a year uh, to uh, from the time when we uh, first conceived of it to actually delivered it. Uh, and I'm really proud of all of the people that worked on that. Uh, we had some great insight uh, from uh, not only SwiftStack, uh, where I work, but uh, we had some great uh, input from Intel. Uh, uh, Red Hat participated, HP, uh, both of them specifically helped out a lot with uh, the testing at the end and the reviewing and uh, making sure that everything was good. Um, we had uh, um, a lot of help from a lot of people in the community, and it's it's been a great a great thing to work on. Uh, one of the talks I proposed for the from the Paris Summit is kind of this community building sort of thing. Is how we how we were able to come together with lots of people from different companies that don't have a common reporting structure and building this giant feature inside of an open source project. So it's been a really fun journey to walk down, and I've been really uh, really pleased and proud of the community as they've done that. Um, so that's a little uh, little side note about the community there, uh, but uh, the important point on this section is talking about uh, the fact that um, the parts of Swift that we've changed and what the impact is to the deployers who are running Swift. Uh, are there any questions about that before we move on to uh, what storage policies enable for the future? Uh, yep, there are actually a couple questions. Great. Um, so is there any mapping with these policy capabilities and those defined in CDMI and uh, presumably, the decision on whether to accept a policy is currently for the application, question mark. Um, my app would have to decide that if I had a policy referencing East Coast and I had data that couldn't possibly live there, my app would make the info, query, and then decide the placement itself. Is that correct? So no brokering? That, okay. That is correct. Uh, we have explicitly chosen to uh, push the choice of the storage policy to the client. And we've done that for a few reasons. Uh, one, which uh, may or may not be a cop-out, but I think is actually a very good technical reason, is the fact that um, when you've got systems running at such a large scale as Swift is doing today, any kind of extra complexity gets really hard, actually, and uh, there's opportunities for bugs and things like that. So by not doing that, it's a simpler system, which means that I can be more confident in its stability and, and longevity. Uh, number two, which I think is actually the more practical reason, is the fact that, and this is not just me speaking, but definitely things I've heard from uh, users as well, is that when you try to automatically migrate data, uh, generally the data is always exactly where you don't want it to be. Uh, so, for example, if you've got uh, a policy that's going to, or you've got some sort of hierarchical storage management and you've got hot content in one tier and cold content in another tier and automatically migrates for you, at that point, uh, 
if you've got something that needs to be moved from cold to hot, well, you wanted it hot. You can't you can't just do that. You can the best you can do is reactively doing that. Um, you, and if you're if you're doing it to say that. Um, oh, I'm about to start accessing that. Well, then that's, again, the client that has that information. It's about to tell the storage system, move this data back and forth. And that is absolutely something that is supported with, uh, with storage policies today. And I fully expect people to deploy um, a, a, a script that would... Um, that would do that would instantiate or initiate a copy of the data from one tier to the other based on certain rules and things like that. It is something that is completely, um, but like I said, I completely assume that people will do it. Um, that's not something that has been uh, pulled into the Swift code base at this point. Um, but for example, if you are deploying things and you have, for example, a high performance and a lower performance tier of storage. Uh, I can fully expect that you might have a nightly job that will, or even an hourly job that looks at the uh, access time or the frequency of access on a uh, on a particular object and could copy it back and forth between the different tiers. There's a few things more to that because obviously if you're uh, if the policies are set on a container basis, the container is part of the reference to the object, so you may have to uh, have a uh, um, an indirection like a, a static large object manifest that would directly point to the other one um, so that you don't have to uh, change the references to the data, the URLs, uh, so you don't break links and things like that. But it's something that's absolutely possible and uh, I expect to be done. Okay. Is there another question? Yep, there is uh, one more question. Can an app that has no knowledge of the policies understand what they refer to based on the metadata? Uh, no. Well, well, if the if the app has no concept of storage policies, then even if it had access to something, I guess they wouldn't make much sense, would they? Uh, but in general, there is no metadata that is stored inside of the object, uh, at least directly, that is uh, that would let you know what sort of policy it is being stored in. So if you download an object, or uh, if somebody gives you a, a packet dump from here is my uh, here, here's the response from just the object. Here's the object metadata and the object body. There's nothing there uh, that's going to be able to tell you, oh, I can tell this was an East Coast storage policy or something like that. The uh, storage policy information is stored in the container metadata. Uh, it is set on container creation. Uh, and then that is, uh, so yeah, that, that's how that's done. Um, there's nothing in the in the object on a per object basis that other than the object can you can see what container it's in and so you could indirectly get it by doing a subsequent request to the container uh, but but no the uh, there's nothing on a per object basis there um, yeah I think that I think that answers that question are there any others or any follow-ups there? Just a brief follow-up from uh, the same person Browdang underscore HP uh, <clears throat> may have asked badly, how does a client understand what the policy refers to? Does ah, it just have right. to understand the name maps to certain functions? Right, okay, so I think the, the question here would be if, for example, you have three policies and they're, they have silly names like legacy tuna fish and cupcake, hypothetically speaking, uh, then how in the world does the client know what cupcake refers to as opposed to tuna fish? Is that the question, I think? Uh, can you repeat, John, please? I, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, well, it, basically, how does the client know what, hypothetically, the storage policy named TunaFish actually means? Is uh, That seems to be the question. Uh, and in that sense, the that is up to the deployer to communicate to their users what that means. So, for example, if HP public cloud is uh, creating a few different storage policies, it's going to be up to HP to make sure that their users understand what their storage policies are. And the same thing with Rackspace. If Cloud Files decides to implement a couple of different storage policies, then uh, it is up to Rackspace to communicate that to their customers. There is no constraints placed on the naming um, other than, uh, yeah, there's a couple of them, but basically they're just, uh, they're just normal uh, strings. Uh, so that the deployer can set them and then do that. Um, and that, that's what you've got there. 
All right, we're good to go. Uh, no okay. further questions, so uh, let's move on. Okay, so just briefly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what storage policies uh, enable for the future and where I see us going from here. Uh, I said earlier that storage policies, in my opinion, are the uh, biggest thing to happen to Swift since the whole thing was open sourced, and I fully believe that. Uh, one of the reasons is not just the power you get with storage policies today with the ability to choose how data is stored and where it's stored within your cluster, but uh, the things that it enables for the future and the things we can build with storage policies. One of the things, in fact, the, the whole reason we started working on storage policies is because we had people looking at Swift and saying that, you know, we'd, we'd really like to use Swift, but we'd also really like to be able to have some of our data be stored uh, using non-replicated storage, specifically erasure codes. And so as we started uh, sketching out what that would look like, uh, that's where we came upon the design we have for storage policies. So storage policies are the first important piece of enabling erasure code support inside of Swift. So what are erasure codes? Uh, erasure codes are something that's been around for quite a while, in fact, since the 60s and the 1960s, and uh, you've, you've already used them uh, quite a bit. Uh, they're common in RAID systems, they're common on the encoding of the uh, the divots and pits inside of uh, the pits and lands on uh, uh, Blu-ray discs and uh, the way that they do error correction and things like that. The point is that it allows you to take a set of data, break it into some number of chunks, calculate some more chunks, and then store all of the resulting pieces um, in the cluster. And if you are able to, it, and you are able to uh, survive the loss of an arbitrary, uh, of, of um, well, let's look at the picture here. So let's say you have K data disks and M parity disks, let's say K data chunks and M parity chunks. Uh, in this case, um, we can uh, lose up to M chunks, any M chunks. So for example, let's say we're using uh, a common uh, erasure code scheme is called Reed Solomon. So let's say we're using a Reed Solomon encoding that is a, a 10 plus 4 scheme. So you've got 10 data chunks and 4 parity chunks. In this case, you end up with 14 chunks overall, which allows you to lose any 4 pieces, and those can be re, uh, recomputed from the resulting 10 pieces. Uh, so the really great thing about this is it gives you high durability of your data, but it allows you to store it more efficiently than, for example, with a full replication. So in a 10 plus 4 scheme, you can see you only have a 40% overhead. So given 100 gigabytes of data, you're storing 140 gigabytes on disk, as opposed to a triple replication system where you would be storing 300 gigabytes on disk. So that's the really huge appeal of erasure codes. Now, nothing's for free, so the downside of erasure codes is that there's going to be a lot more CPU and network overhead for a particular request on erasure codes, but for certain sorts, of, certs, I'm sorry, for certain sets of data, specifically that which is uh, around uh, larger things like backups, uh, uh, virtual machine images, um, and things that are not uh, accessed particularly frequently, then uh, erasure codes become a very interesting and compelling uh, solution. So the way that works inside of a storage policy is that you've got, you can have your traditional 3x replication, and then you can also, on the same set of hardware, choose an erasure code policy that then will uh, splay those chunks across uh, the fragments of the overall uh, uh, data um, across all of the disks, and so you you do still get, or all the servers there, um, so you do still get very high uh, durability because you, uh, you're you still protected against the different failure domains, um, but it allows you to uh, to do, uh, to store it a little bit more efficiently uh, in, in, in regard, with regards to uh, the, the actual media, storage media. Um, so that's the big thing that we're working on right now. Uh, we are working on that in the community as we speak, uh, specifically uh, SwiftStack, Intel, Box, uh, eVault, uh, and a few others are uh, contributing daily to uh, ensure that that is moving forward. And I'm excited about uh, seeing that uh, come, uh, become available in Swift in the months ahead. 
and beyond uh, beyond erasure codes, this is uh, this is the big thing that we're working on for the future with uh, storage policies. But the great thing is that storage policies give deployers a lot of freedom and flexibility to build a Swift cluster that exactly matches their use case. This is, uh, in some senses, the big promise of cloud is that you can now. Uh, exactly tailor your infrastructure to your use cases. And storage policies allow you to do that in a much, uh, much more fine, uh, at, at a much more fine grain level than you've been able to do so in the past um, with your Swift storage systems. And that's why I'm really so excited about it, is that we can now uh, cheaply, uh, with regards to hard drive space, uh, store things with erasure codes as we develop that. We're able to match things to particular geographies, for example, uh, the EU in particular uh, is very peculiar about where data is being stored, um, so you can choose that in your in your overall Swift global cluster. Uh, being able to uh, uh, focus on the locality of access, being able to uh, build things that are better for um, disaster recovery, offsite locations, uh, even active-active uh, failover uh, system uh, clusters. Um, those sorts of things are now uh, possible. Uh, on, a, on a much fi more fine-grained uh, resolution than they have been in the past. And I'm really excited to see where you take storage policies and SWIFT in the future. Um, we haven't even really talked about much today. I haven't, haven't mentioned much about uh, even taking advantage of new, uh, newer hardware as it becomes available, like the Seagate Kinetic Platform, any other kind of uh, storage systems, or storage hardware, storage media that are... Uh, exposed. This will allow you to start slowly ingesting in that and not have to forklift replace your entire cluster just to take uh, advantage of a new uh, of a new set of uh, a new technology. Uh, but you can gradually replace as your older hardware uh, gets gets deprecated. Um, so these are the things that are really exciting to me about where we take uh, storage policies in the future and the things that allow uh, are are enabled uh, in the future. So at this point, if you're interested in looking uh, at more, uh, there's three links here. The first one, uh, the Launchpad Swift page, uh, is where you can find the official tarball of Swift 2.0. Um, I expect, uh, and as I said, this is part of the overall Juno uh, OpenStack release cycle, and uh, this code, or uh, maybe a release or two later, will be included in the Juno integrated release. Uh, if you're looking for developer documentation, including a lot of information on storage policies, look at swift.openstack.org. And anytime you're interested, especially in contributing, but any even usage questions, uh, feel free to join us on Freenode IRC in the, in the pound uh, openstack-swift channel. Uh, my IRC nickname is not my name, which is where you can also find me on Twitter, or you can email me at me at not.mn. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, there are actually no more questions. So, John, thank you very much for, for uh, your presentation. For all those who uh, dropped in later and uh, <clears throat> missed the first part of, this, of John's presentation, um, the recorded session will be available in just a couple minutes. And um, thank you all for watching. Thank you, John, very much for your presentation, and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much for having me.